Good evening, everyone. I believe we should be streaming. We should be live right now. Please drop the typical one in the chat so that I know that the audio is coming through. And today, of course, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, well, everyone says Lloyd's channel is great, except for him. And it's only good when the Thunderous One is on. And we have that man with us today. Hello, Thunderous One. Hi, Lloyd. Um, hi, everybody. And <laughs> those are really kind words. I'm not so sure I deserve them, but um, I'll take them nonetheless because it I deserve them. Yep. Okay. I just checked the audio. It's coming through great. Uh, you do. Yeah. So <laughs> good evening, everybody. We've got Horse, of course. We've got Azul. We've got Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. Uh, great to see you. Lilo Main can't make it. She was here earlier, but she has an appointment. And Dragon, thank you very much for, for, for being here, as always. And I've got Sergeant Grinch, Sandro Correa, Ernesto, and uh, yeah, Just Janice. Welcome all. And guys, pinned in the top of the chat is a link. I've also dropped the link in the chat earlier in the beginning. It's the um, for those who... Um, yeah, it's, for, it's free for everyone. The first 14 slides of a presentation I'm busy working on about Gnosticism and early Christianity. It's going to be an in-depth discussion on the early Christian church and Gnosticism and how the two were clashing, how Gnostics twisted the scriptures. And of course, we will be discussing once again Dan Brown or Dumb Brown and the Da Vinci Clown, his book. Sorry, the Da Vinci Code. I keep getting that wrong. So we'll be discussing the the utter falsehoods that, that scholars and authors and others actually tell about the Bible going through the original history, the verifiable sources. We will discuss Nag Hammadi. We will discuss the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. So this is going to be, I thought it would be 200 slides. I think it's actually going to be about 300. Um, so I've made the first 14 available for the audience. And for those who are members, I've made the first 30 slides available to you or the first 31. Uh, please check the subscription. Uh, please check the membership tab. Uh, I've left a post there and I've, I've made several um, presentations available to you as members. So thank you all for your support. And uh, yeah, one more thing. Let me show you something. So let's see. Thunderous is here. Let's see. Any comments? Oh, by the way, I want to show you guys something. This was from St. Constantina. I hope he doesn't mind me using his name, but I want to show you this. He says, hey, Lloyd, I just want to say I really appreciate all the information you've given out. I've learned a ton. And I've been spreading the information I've learned to people who want to listen. I actually got a co-worker to go from being an atheist to accepting Jesus Christ, which is amazing. Um, I'm very humbled when this happens. And I've had so many people write to me and that my work does this for them. And I I didn't set out perhaps with that intention or, or maybe I did. Maybe I think that the only way to deal with the craziness and the nastiness in the world today is to to turn towards Christ, turn towards Christianity, turn towards the church. Are your thoughts before I go on, Thunderous? No, no, no thoughts at the moment. I was just busy looking in the um, chat, looking at uh, some of the people are commenting, and there's one guy there, Akra, who's an ex-Muslim too, and I was just putting in a comment that um, I hope I say things that would um, resonate with him as well. But also, I'd just like to say, if because um, I'll be speaking, hopefully Lloyd and myself are going to be doing a three-part series. Um, the first part is going to be predominantly um, my experience of being raised Muslim uh, and with the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. Um, the second part will hopefully be with reference to my sort of um, period with atheism and in particular Darwinian evolution. Uh, and then the third part would be um, the why I accept the biblical narrative as reality. So, um, so if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask, hopefully I'll pick them up in time. And um, yeah, so yeah, thank you, Lloyd, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. yeah, let me share my screen with you for the few minutes, Thunderous, just so you can see what I'm showing at the moment. Okay, so that's done. Um, so yeah, he says I got a coworker to go from being an atheist to accepting Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, this is, it's always very humbling for me to hear that. But um, I'm really so grateful to receive this message that he sent me. And he says, I'm oh, sure you don't remember. Sorry, Thunderous? No, I was just saying that um, it goes to show the little things, there's nothing bigger. So, you know, um, the fact that um, you've had, um, you've contributed to much of um, people's understanding of how the world works since the first century with atheism and um, Islam, that 
you, if that's somebody who's made a comment about the experience that they've had with your information, Lloyd, and I wonder if everybody wrote something, how much the um, influence has been in total. This has been somebody who's written their one account. It'd be nice if other people have had experiences too to put their comments in there, because I'm sure you've had a great influence on a great deal of many people for the number of years that you've been doing this. Yeah, no, I've, I get emails sometimes. I, there were times I would get like several of them in a row, and um, yeah, it's been it's been really humbling. He says, I'm sure you don't remember, but we interacted on YouTube when I commented Matthew 6.6 6 a long time ago. I don't remember what Matthew 6.6 6 is. I admitted to myself afterwards, maybe I'm wrong, and that perhaps I don't know as much as I thought at the time, being a Protestant Baptist, and I learned the history of the church, the fathers, the councils, and how we got the Bible. I began attending RCIA last year, and I will be confirmed in the Catholic Church, Easter 2024. Thank you, brother, and God bless. And I said, I'm really happy to learn this. That is a profound turnaround. Thank you for sharing this news with me. Must have taken a lot of courage to take this step. And he says, it's all been a different change of life and pace, but worth it tenfold. So, so just a news update for everyone. Um, and then also, guys, I've released the first 50 slides of my Pius the 10th series. It's on coffee, right? So what I'll do is I'll just uh, copy the link. I'll drop the link in the chat. This is Pius X versus modernism. So Pius X and modernism. I will drop this in the chat. That's in the coffee shop. And so I've added a couple more slides. So for those who want to get hold of that, um, I'm offering it for $5 at the moment. And again, please check the attached, uh, the pinned link, the pinned comment in the chat. That's a free 14 slides of my new presentation on Gnosticism and the early church. Oh, and by the way, guys, I was in the UK. Uh, let me just stop sharing because uh, I don't have to share the thunderous right now. So, yeah, I, I was in the UK briefly and um, I got to meet the thunderous one. I also got to meet Century since. It was quite an experience. Um, so that was, and they dro both drove like an hour and a half to meet me. I was in the middle of nowhere. They both drove out. So, so thanks, thunderous, for coming out and meeting me and us having a steak pie and the fish and chips in the pub. <laughs> it was um, a wonderful experience. It was well worth the journey. Um, and for those who, have who are probably unaware, uh, Lloyd and myself go back um, several years. In fact, we actually met on a different channel, uh, spoke to each other on another channel, which was um, with reference to um, apolo um, apologetics or polemics against Islam. Um, we lost contact. Um, then we met again on uh, Mr. T's channel, that's Reason and Answers. And then finally, we got to meet us, uh, each other on Monday night, um, uh, uh, in a pub in uh, Cambridge and uh, a very pleasant experience and looking forward to um, when we can do that again. So thank you for the opportunity as well, Lloyd. Yeah, definitely. I, my visa is limited, so I need to make a plan to do so. And I'll be in touch about that. I'll be in touch. And um, also, guys, I will be in Barcelona. So if there's anyone from Barcelona, um, check, the, check my uh, community tab. I've made a comment there and... Um, yeah, that might be interesting to be able to to meet up with one or two of you who might be in Barcelona. I'll be there for an entire week. So um, obviously, I, I, I do want to practice caution. You know, I don't want uh, someone to try one of those, uh, you know, yeah, you just never know. But um, I don't want to meet any crazies. But do reach out and we'll, we'll chat this week and um, I'll, I'll share the details. And perhaps I can meet one or two of you who happen to be based in Barcelona. And also, I do expect to be traveling quite a bit this year. So hopefully, I'll be able to meet in Switzerland or Germany or, uh, you know, Italy or other places. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, Thunderous, over to you. And thank you, Just Janice. And thank you, Cetos, for the purchase. And Just Janice, thank you. My gosh, thank you very much for the generosity from all of you. Much appreciated. So, yeah, Thunderous, over to you. Okay, then. So this is, I haven't got a script that I'm working to. And um, I don't know if you've got any questions that you've perhaps um, prepped up, Lloyd, or hopefully, um, if you haven't. I, I wanted um, you to start, maybe just your thoughts, and then I'll, yeah. I'll ask some questions. Yeah. Sure. So, um, Thunderous One, obviously, I'm not, uh, I have to be discreet with what my real name is. Um, but yeah, uh, Thunderous One, born in 1968 um, in the United Kingdom. Um, I am um, what at the time you would call during the 70s um, mixed race or half caste of uh, or in current political terms now I have to use the term um, dual heritage so I'm part um, Asian and part English 
Um, but that doesn't mean to say that though I was born uh, mixed race, that you're not raised um, as a full Muslim, as it were. Uh, if your father is a Muslim, then it goes by nature that um, you'll be raised up as a Muslim in the Pakistani community of uh, the United Kingdom. So the reason why I mentioned why um, or what year I was born in 68 is because there is a kind of relevance that you're seeing the first generation of the immigrants that came over to the United Kingdom in the 50s and the early 60s, that first generation of those um, that, that came over. But also, being 56 this year that I am, you're also seeing the first um, generation as well as of mixed race or dual heritage or half caste children, not just with Asians, but with the black community as well. Um, so, and I think it's at this point, it might be a good uh, point as well of reference that to give an idea, a visual idea of what it's like um, to be brought up um, with, say, a Pakistani father and an English mother, I, I would highly recommend the movie East is East. I would say that much of what's in that movie, about a good 80% of that, is absolutely factual. Um, that is a very, very good account as to what it's, be, what it's like to be raised up as a Muslim um, in the United Kingdom, particularly during that period of time. So, yeah, um, raised Muslim. Um, in the community but i don't and i think i've said this before on lloyd's show i certainly said it on um Nuria's com uh, show that uh, though i was raised as a muslim um my father in fact was actually a communist he wasn't really a muslim wow. not in a, in any sense i think what people have to understand is that when you're brought up as a muslim in the muslim community much of what you do is done by rote or it's done by culture. It's a cultural expectation. So though I was raised as a Muslim, the Quran school wasn't something that I had to go because my father expected me to go there to learn Islam and to become a good Muslim. It was predicated on the expectations of the Muslim community of the country at the time. So that's just right. what you do, as it were. Right. And when you're, when you're in Quran school, what tends to happen is everything that you learn is in Arabic. You, it's, it's a language so you, you can, you learn the alphabet and then you learn how to join up the writing and then from there it progresses to um, the memorization of the Quran. So it's not really, you're not taking in information in a manner that you actually understand and can digest. So you're, uh, the, the, the illustration I would use is it's very much like um, we speak English in this country and we use the English alphabet symbols in order to form words that in then construct sentences. Now we can use those same symbols to say write French, write something in French. In fact, the French language uses English symbols in its language. So an English person that can't speak French can in effect get a French newspaper and almost read what is in the newspaper, though not necessarily understanding it of what he's actually reading. In the same way, in uh, in pretty much, I would say, around the world, when you are in Quran school and you're learning things in Arabic, you're learning it in an Arabic text and you could possibly read it, but that does not mean that you actually understand what you're reading. So everything is sort of perfunctory right. and by rupture. You're not really taking any information. But you can read it, but you don't necessarily understand. You can read and pronounce the words, but you don't necessarily understand the, exactly. the meanings. Exactly. And that's what um, East is East is very good at. It actually shows you and it teaches with violence as well. So that um, when I say it teaches with violence, they teach you um, in a form of ryth rhythmic patterns. Okay, so there's a lot of rocking forward, back and forth, and I think that's a method, a methodology in order to memorize the words because you're memorizing them to a rhythm, very much like um, the way that people would learn, you know, upon repetition, how they would pick up the words to a song. But when you're asked to recite what you've learned and you make an error, you are inflicted with an injury, probably with a rod or a stick or some kind of implement. So it's 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 a lesson not taught with love. It's a it's a formula taught with violence. Okay, there is punishment at the end if you don't get anything right. And from my observation, because I lived in Pakistan for about six months, it happens over there as well. So that's how um, Islam is taught until you get to a certain point where you start learning it for yourself in your own language, where you get hold of a copy of the Quran. You're punished if you don't learn. Um, you're punished if you don't learn. I, you're punished if you don't learn correctly as well, depending okay. on the type of imams and what influences that they have in that community as well. The higher up or more respected he is, the more that they can get away with.
Right. I have 10 questions that, that I, on the screen. I'm sharing them with you now as well and also to the audience. But we can use these or, or we can also just, um, you know, take audience questions if the audience have any questions. And then we can also, um, you know, as we bounce off, each, off the conversation. But you mentioned your father was a communist. So you escaped that. How did you not become a communist yourself? Um, uh, no, uh, uh, communism is predicated on atheism. So as I said, part two, I might touch on that because uh, atheism in itself is predicated on Darwinian evolution. So I bypassed the whole well, communism. Communism is, is also atheistic, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So communism is basically atheism, but atheism in itself is predicated on Darwinian evolution. So I have to study Darwinian evolution to, in order to make decisions as to how I view the world. Okay, so that would possibly be more suited to the part two um, when I go when I talk about why I didn't accept atheism and Darwinian evolution. Yeah. So, so I'm just reading another question. Can you share with us your journey from da, 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 where were any specific events or experiences that led you to leave Islam and embrace Christianity? Uh, the, the embrace Christianity would probably be, be part three, why I accept the biblical narrative, as I call it. But as far as specific events or experiences, th there are two numerous. I think one has to bear in mind that w I, when I talk about Islam, I'm going to use the word Islam. But when I talk about brown-skinned people, I'm going to refer to the Sikhs and the Hindus as well. Because when what people don't seem to understand is that the, the the religions may be different but the culture is pretty much exactly the same so you can have um a community with people say sikhs in there well let's, let's say sikhs hindus and muslims as an example they all wear the same clothes they all speak the same language they all speak the same uh, uh, uh speak uh, eat the same foods and they pretty much speak the same, you know, have cultural language, um, cultural similarities. It's only the religions that divide. Yet there are many things that are in common between them, if that makes sense. So if you're brought up in um, the Muslim community, you're pretty much you will pretty much understand what Sikhs are. You'll pretty much understand what um, Hindus are as well. So that's pretty much um, when, when I refer to brown skinned people, that's who I'm referring to. And there's a reason why I say this, because it's going to come out a little bit later on as to the worldview that these people have against non brown skinned people. So just going back to things that started to, to question why I left Islam, one has to bear in mind being brought up in the, the 70s in this country, for those who are of my generation um, will remember that when you went to school, you had things like assembly and there were certain Christian uh, lessons that you had at school. And I was always fascinated from a very young age about Jesus. I mean, that there was just something about this guy. You, we would have little ladybird books about Jesus and you would learn about Jesus. But the, I, I can't remember anything in particular because of the, the, you know, we're talking about you know nearly 50 years ago now, but Jesus kind of featured quite predominantly um, in very much in school activity, as it were. But also in, in the 70s growing up, there was a, um, a lot of um, gospel, if you like, uh, programs on TV. There was a lot of Christian TV. So there'd be pro programs about, say, for instance, the Turin Shroud, or there'd be um, worship programs on a Sunday. So Christianity in the UK at the time was pretty much still a, 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 a show of force or strength in the community. It held community cohesively together uh, with its objective moral values. Um, but so being raised as a Muslim, you, you had that um, influence as well. But being raised as a Muslim, though, you are pretty much told from the Quran school and the community, being in the, in the Pakistani community, white people will never accept you they hate you you will not be accepted by them so at a very young age it's and there's an inculcation process of that the community and the country that you live in will never accept you because of what you are you're brown skinned and you're muslim and these people will hate you so a lot it destroys of destroys any hope of integration or loyalty it starts from a very young age as well. This is why when you're looking at the communities around the country, predominantly with the Muslim community and in, with the Hindu community as well, they're very insular. They're, they don't integrate. The Hindus are very much the same, but, the, but with the Hindu community, they're not belligerent. They're not antagonistic. They just keep themselves to themselves. 
they don't um, they don't overtly behave in a, in a manner that brings any kind of reproach on their community. If anything that you would say negative about the Hindu community is that their corner shops are too expensive. Other than that, you don't really hear anything in the media about the Hindu community, but the Hindu community is quite big in this country. And I dare say in other European countries as well as a big Hindu community, but you don't really hear anything from them. The Sikh community is very much like the same as the Hindu community. They don't behave in a manner that brings reproach on their community. You know, they're very sort of like acting up. I don't know if this is the right word to put it, in a very covert way. You just wouldn't see them around. They don't bring reproach in the way of criminal activity. The Hindus are very much the same. They don't bring reproach on the community but by, by being deliberately embroiled in politics. They don't uh, bring reproach on their communities by being deliberately antagonistic with local communities and such. So the Sikh and the Hindus behave in a very sort of like, uh, they're insular, but they don't behave in a manner that brings reproach. Whereas the Islamic community, it's you're, you're taught at a very young age, hate and dislike. That that's, no, that's not what you're to do. That's what the English will do to you. So the natural, if you like, reaction to that is, well, if they're not going to like me, I'm not going to like them. I personally was a little bit different. I'm not suggesting I'm an exception. I was a little bit different to react in, in that kind of way. So that's pretty much um, how it is being brought up as a Muslim um, in, in this country. You, you really, it's a community with a community, it's a law within the law. And it's it's almost like a mini culture, a mini a mini country in itself. The community, in, in the fact that there are cultural walls uh, walls that don't allow other communities to penetrate. They call them the, parallel communities. Parallel communities, exactly that. Yeah. Now that's interesting. They, yeah. So, but they create even if they aren't any, they create this artificial barrier to exclude native Brits from 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 being friends with native Brits. But then they'll they have a crafty manner of saying, but it's their fault. Your they're, they're, the Muslims are very the Muslim community, and I dare say by extension other communities are very good, and we're seeing it in the media today. The, the Muslims are probably the first to do this. They're very good at creating a problem, then playing the victim, and that's how we pretty much see the Muslim community yeah, behaving. But, no but that's an old strategy. Look at look at um, every single war in the Middle East against Israel. Israel was attacked and then you know and then they they fight back they and then the muslims turn around and then cry and then claim that they're the victims yeah exactly that so the number four question asks what aspects of christianity resonate with you and drew you towards the faith i think that that's a very good question because th th there's two there's two scriptures that come to mind when answering that genesis 126 where god says um, let's make man in our image um, so when you're looking at Genesis 126 and it says, let's make man in our image, that, 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 that's clearly kind of like, as human beings, we reflect godly qualities, you know, love, peace, wisdom, righteousness and such. You don't see any of those qualities in Islam. You can't avoid as a human being those qualities that you're imbued with. And the other one um, I would think is probably Romans 3 or Romans 5, where Paul talks about the, you know, the flesh being weak and miserable man that I am. What, when I want to do good, what is bad is present with me. It's only when you start looking at scriptures in the Bible that you can actually see, like James, the book of James says that like the Bible is like a reflection, is like a, mir a mirror. You look at you look at the mirror and you see yourself in it. So when... You just, can you just, you just go back to that question? Just sorry, yeah. Okay, we go here. Yeah. The, the one the, I forgot what the question was because I was just leading. Oh, the questions. Oh, the questions. My bad. Uh, we were asking. Um... Oh, so what questions resonate with you? So go using the word resonate. Then, so I would say when when you it's only when you look at the scriptures of the Bible that you turn that you can see that there are certain characteristics that resonate with you. So when you look at Genesis one twenty six, another one would be Ecclesiastes, where it talks about uh, I think it's Ecclesiastes, where it talks about. Um, um, time indefinite is put in their heart that mankind might find out the works of the true God is made from the start to the finish. So there are certain things that you read in the Bible that you think that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. But when you start reading the Quran, you start reading the uh, the Quran in your in um, in English in the language that you understand. There is nothing that resonates with you. There is mm -hmm. nothing that resonates with a person. And, and I've often said. Um, bit growing up as Muslim, if you're a person that likes to hate, if you if you're a person full of anger, if you're a person that wants to inflict violence on people, 
but you need a justification in order to do that. Islam is the perfect religion for you. It is the religion of hate. It is the religion of violence. It is the religion of belligerence. So if that's the kind of person that you, you are and you want a religion that resonates, go choose Islam. Well, but if you want... I wanted to mention something. Um, this is the new sli set of slides that I'm busy working on, which you can see under us. Um, this is Gnosticism and Early Christianity from Da Vinci Code to Nag Hammadi. Right, and I want to go down here. I'm busy. Let me see here. Oh. Okay, so wait. I need to go to not oh, this slide. Okay, here. Um, within the Gnostics, within the, the Gnostics claim and and we're going to see a parallel here. We're going to look at some of the old Jewish views as well as some of the Gnostics. But Christianity is the first religion to elevate the status of women. Women had a very low view in, in 2,000 years ago. right? Even in Roman culture, even in, in, in Jewish culture, there were, there were certain issues but with the Gnostics as well. But they've, they've all turned around and tried to make the claim that Christianity is misogynistic, that Christianity denigrates women right but what is interesting is that jesus had women as companions with as disciples women had women were in leadership positions within his ecclesiastical group this was absolutely and totally unheard of two thousand years ago that just didn't happen and jesus becomes the same i'll show you a couple of um, statements um for instance this is from philo he's a jew now what in one in one statement they basically says for instance you'll see this is this is Josephus right um, he says that um, he says a woman says the scripture a woman is inferior to her husband in all things right now he says says the scripture and in fact this is not in the scripture at all this is in the Talmud or you know with within these secondary texts which are extra biblical this is not something but he actually calls for for him at that time within that context. This was the view that a woman is inferior to her husband in all things. Now, now this when you read through the later Talmud, right, this is in the earlier Talmud, uh, the um, the the Jerusalem Talmud. When you go to the Babylonian Talmud, much of this stuff is removed, and the status of women changes. But when you look at at the pre, at the the milieu that Jesus grew up in, women were were very had a very low status. For instance. Um, they say here, this is Philo, the woman has no part in the noose and she is not fashioned in the image of God. Right? Woman has no part in the mind of God. Woman has no part in the mind or the intellect of God and woman is not fashioned in the image of God. That's Philo on the creation, right? And so this is a completely different view. And then we continue to the next page. You'll see here, and this is very Islamic, right? Philo says... Um, the woman says to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. And he says, but the woman was more accustomed to be deceived than the man. Through her softness, she easily yields and is easily caught by the persuasions of falsehood. Philo, questions and answers on Genesis. Right? So he believes that women have, are, are passion-driven. Men are rational. And men have to keep women's sexuality under control. And he says here, wives must be slaves to their husbands. A servitude not imposed by violent ill-treatment, but promoting obedience in all things. That's Philo and Hypothetica 7.3. But this is very Islamic. They've taken this idea and run with it. Here you've got this Jewish idea from the Jerusalem Talmud era, which then Muslims have clearly taken, and they've made it, shall we say, even more toxic. Uh, your well, thoughts on, on that, Thunderous? Well, well, yeah, I was going to go into one of the reasons why um, I, I had an, a hatred for Islam as well as its treatment of women. But just going on what you just said there, that is almost like verbatim in the Quran, isn't it? With the exception that you can inflict violence. That's the only difference. Yes, yes. Yeah, remember, but even they tell us, no, it's not violence. It's hit her with a toothbrush. Right. Yeah, uh, so, uh, according to Zakir Naik, or hit her with a handkerchief. It's symbolic. It's a symbolic beating. Yeah, but it's not. We we know that. So would, yeah, but I was just going to say, which which is actually quite damning because I don't know what books these people are reading. It certainly isn't the Bible because um, just going on with what you said about um, the women 
Rahab is an example. If, if, if people turn around and say that the Bible is full of, say, like misogyny against women, they clearly haven't read the, um, the, the example of Rahab who rescued or saved or protected the two spies that went out in, uh, from the nation of Israel to spy out the land of Jericho. She protected them. Okay, she gave them um, an opportunity to leave via another window from her premises. The nation of Israel then obviously took over Jericho. And what happened to Rahab? She ended up in the lineage of Jesus. She married a guy that got that, and from that relationship. They had the son Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. And if you look at the Jesus's lineage, it comes through Rahab as well. So to suggest that the God of the Bible doesn't bless women and is misogynistic, it's completely contemptible for any human being to say that. Yeah, no, I'll be discussing that. I'm still busy working on these slides. I, to, I finished here. And um, so, for instance, the, the Bible does not indicate that women are dumber than men, right? This is just no. not in the New Testament, right? And notice, and it's better that. than the words of the law shall be burned than that a woman shall be given those words, right? Uh, it is better that the words of the law should be burned than that they should be given to a woman, a woman. That's in the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. It has been removed from the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, now, I often get criticized by Christians for not lying about the Talmud and not criticizing Jews. For those who, and also then there were those who criticized me for not criticizing the Catholic Church. I've done so, but I refuse to lie about them. I'd like to have evidence and say, look, here is what I believe to be a legitimate criticism, not some lie that was made up by the Russians in the 1800s or by the Gnostics in the 200s or by German scholars in the 1800s or whatever the case might be, or even by guys like John MacArthur who, you know, or whatever, by, by, by modern, you know, Christians who, who make up all sorts of amazing lies. Um, here I want, to, I want to be very clear about what is a legitimate criticism we can point to with evidence versus just fiction that people make up. So here, I mean, this is a very sexist statement, right? But it is removed from the Babylonian Talmud, and there is a change. If you look at the Babylonian Talmud, it has a completely different view of women that, that elevates them in a very different way. And he says here also, this is in the Talmud, he that talks much with women brings evil upon himself, and he neglects the study of the Torah, and at last will inherit hell, right? Gehenna. However, Jesus speaks very often to women in the New Testament, and his behavior is utterly contrary to this. Despite the fact that feminists and others want to claim, and atheists want to claim that the New Testament is sexist, Jesus completely went against the prevailing attitudes, the negative attitudes against women in the day. You've even got the rabbis taught, this is the governing principle. Any evidence which a woman is not valid to offer testimony, also women are not valid to offer testimony. This is an Islamic view that's in Josephus. Uh, your thoughts on it, so that you continue. Well, for, for, for starters, the first thing that came to my mind is if people think that about Jesus um, or, or the, um, the New Testament, then people need to read the account of uh, the Samaritan woman at the well that um, gave Jesus a glass of water and look at the way that Jesus spoke to her. Then we have the accounts of the prostitute that was crying at Jesus' feet and she wiped off her tears with her hair and look at what Jesus said to her. Then you have the um, the other woman that took out, was it the nard and rubbed that, that, that perfumed oil in Jesus' hair. The apostles were making comments to her and Jesus turned around and says, leave her alone because what she has done will be told around the world as a remembrance of her. Then when you consider that uh, Mary and Martha were also um, Jesus' close um, followers as well, and you find as well, when you, th when you read the Gospel account from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, when you look at the women, they seem to get the sense of what was going on with Jesus more than the men. The men were more talking about like John and James, who was the greatest or... You know, who was going to sit in his left hand side and who is right hand side. And Peter was saying, I will never, you know, like um, disown you or reject you. Yeah, so all of those men had to have counsel put on them for, for what for their actions and their um, the comments that they were making. Whereas the women, it was almost like they certainly spiritually got the sense of what Jesus is all about. So and then then you go to Corinthians and I think it's first Corinthians where it talks about the sexual relations between a man and a woman where, you know, you don't use the sexual relationship and intimacy as a weapon against each other to give each one to their due. Then you've got the one I think it's in the book of Peter where it talks about that if a man doesn't he should cherish his wife 
treat her as the weaker vessel. Not that she's physically weak, but let, let's be honest. Let's have it right. Men are emotionally made differently to women. If mm. if you've got a mother and a father who's got, a, say, a son, and the son falls over, the father's likely to turn and say, oh, get up, it's only a scrap. Whereas the mother's going to run over to the child and brush his knee, kiss him, and, you know, it's going to be better and, you know, emotionally reacts differently. So in that context, it says treat the woman as a different as 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 the weaker vessel because women's emotions are different to men's but also at the same time i think it's in the same book where it turns around and says that if a man mistreats his wife god's not listening to his prayers that's how serious it is that god will not listen to the man's prayers if he's mistreating his wife then you've got the scripture mm -hmm. i think it's in first timothy chapter five where it talks about um if a man um doesn't look after his own own household because the man is the head of the family, he's worse than the person without faith. So all these things I'm mentioning, I mean, for, for, they're, they're great for this example, but these are the things that sort of made me think, hang on a minute here, this is far superior than what the Quran can offer. Any one of these verses is far superior than all the verses put together, in the, uh, all the ayah together in the yeah. Quran with reference on how to treat the woman. I've often gone to Muslims and turned around and said, well, okay, then let's have let's have a, 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 a discussion. Then. You bring me all the, the, um, the hadith and the ayah in the Quran about how to treat your wife. I'll bring everything that I've got to turn around and say about everything that's in the Bible about how to treat your wife. And let's sit here in front of a group of women and turn and say, well, which one would they rather have as a husband, a Muslim or a Christian? And then, you know, then you get the useful, useless arguments that, no, the Quran's never been corrupted. Well, we all know that argument is totally flawed now. But even if it was true that the Quran's never been corrupted, where is the joy? Where is the pride? Where is the you know, boast when one of your ayah in 420, 434, is it 424, where it says, you know, if you, fought, if you fear mis uh, disobedience in your wife, you can beat her. I don't care. Yeah. You know, even if it is without um, changing the Quran. There's no joy in, in that text being preserved for 1,400 years. And then, there's another one. Yeah, if you look at a woman, yeah, you committed adultery in your heart. That shows you the seriousness of a relationship between a man and a woman. The context of that there is if you're a married person. Absolutely. Whereas in Islam, the Quran says you can have two or three or four wives and unlimited concubines with all that your right hand possesses, treating women as nothing more than chattel. Right. I just wanted to follow up on a question that was asked. A little bit off topic, but yeah, that um, from Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, he asked about Sethian Gnosticism. So Sethian Gnosticism is, focuses on Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve in the Bible. Um, although it may be that Seth also happens to be one of the manifestations of, um, of Idris, of Thoth, also known as Hermes Trismegistus. So there's some sort of overlap within the Hermetic world. Uh, you've got Thoth, also known as Idris in Islam, right? So, so basically, so Sethian Gnostic, now Gnosticism in prior to so Gnosticism as a full system only really developed in the second and third centuries. Before that, there were elements of it based on the Old Testament, but it was not a full, complete system as as well developed as the systems that that came out of the third and fourth centuries. That said, there were Gnostic texts as late as the very late 1st century or early 2nd century, between, say, 95 and 120. You had the Book of Alchesai, right? The, the, the Book of Alchesai. I have to return to that because I've done this in the past. I will be doing more on this. But um, so basically, this is the, the early precursors to full-blown Gnosticism, which eventually took on very Christian attributes. So it's, it's a heresy that takes on Christian attributes where Sethi Gnosticism is really takes on very strong Jewish attributes. Uh, I wouldn't say it's as well developed as as second, third century Gnosticism, but this name, so Thoth, yeah, so so there's a relationship here as well with Seth and Thoth, Hermes Trismegistus, and Idris. Okay, uh, back to you, Thunderous. I don't know where we were. Uh, so yeah, so um, so th those are the parallels that you learn um, as you're growing up about um, what. Uh, the influences of Christianity, where you, you you come across these, and then then being brought up as a Muslim, you know how um, you see Islam um, in um, in action within the community as to how they treat you know 
girls of my age and then you see it as to like um, women of your mother's generation how they are treated how if you went to a friend's house or a family's house the women are in one room while the men are in another room so it's sort of like there's a two-tiered class system the men mm -hmm. would eat first and then the children would eat with the women second you know so how old were you again when you decided to to make the conversion well, we, we took the things I, I didn't well I convert. It was a natural conclusion. I don't call it conversion. I call it a natural conclusion to reconcile yeah. with God because that's what Christianity is, isn't it? It's your it took years, but how sort of how old were you when it started to maybe when it finished? Um, I, I would say that I had questions when I was at home that um, if, if there is a truth, as it were, Islam could not possibly be the truth with what I was reading, how violent it was, how mendacious it is, um, how hateful it is, how spiteful it is, not just within the text of um, the Quran as I managed to get one in, in English, but also you see the manifestation within the Islamic community. You would hear things, for instance, the Muslim community behind closed doors saying things about, say, um, Palestine is a good example or any other sort of like political movement taking place in the world where Islam felt that it was being um, pressured or persecuted. It, they would have one language that was inside closed doors, then you'd have another one that was there in the public community. So what we're seeing is pure hypocrisy. So that was also another influence to me that there's this image of Islam, that the real Islam, which takes place behind closed doors. And then there's the public persona of how people behave in the community for the rest of the world to see that they're this high, 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 pious, holy, religious people. Well, in reality, you know, here's an example of how how I what I came across with them. Pornography in the 80s was almost like a currency for these people. Because with their video tape to tape, VHS tape copying um, or pornography to each other. And then you get to understand this is another reason why they have this argument or they'll bring up this argument that uh, white people are useless people or they're scum of the earth and such. It's because one of the con um, contributors to that is pornography. Because when you're living in, say, uh, Muslim lands and you have access to pornography, what you're predominantly seeing is white women having sex. That's what you're watching. It's predominantly white women. You're not seeing brown-skinned women, black-skinned women, yellow-skinned women. Mm -hmm. You're predominantly seeing white-skinned women. And that's going to be natural because the demographic of pornography is from the Western European world. So naturally, you're going to see Western European white women having sex in pornography. But their view is, or it's inculcated in their mind, white women are cheap, white women are gagging for it, white women love sex. So th th they view coming over to European countries as not just an opportunity for uh, migration to get away from the slums where they're living or to get away from any Muslim rule and Sharia law, which they particularly hate, but it's also to come over the land where women are just laying in the streets with their legs open, can't wait to be shafted by other men. That's their view. That's one of the contributing factors as to why we have this, um, if you like, uh, tier system where white women are viewed as whores by predominantly brown people. And, for, and pornography is a major contributor to that worldview. Yeah, but there's also the status thing. Um, I mean, but the, the irony being, the irony being is that um, when they don't marry brown, they marry white, but they never marry black. And this is this is the irony of uh, of it all. Because when you're brought up as a Muslim in the Pakistani community. They tell you to hate white and they try to side with black. So when you look at, say, black lads, if you were, even from my generation, it was kind of like happening. The brown skinned people or brown skinned boys will start hanging around black skinned boys. And what you find is that uh, the brown skinned boys start talking like the black skinned boys. They start dressing like the black skinned boys. They start walking like the black skinned boys. They start listening to R&B and hip hop. You very rarely see a brown skinned lad listening to, say, um, bands or rock or metal or anything. It tends to be pretty much um, the hip hop and the R&B scene. And yet the irony is this is that when you look at the community, you'll find more brown-skinned men married to white-skinned women than you'll find more brown-skinned men married to black-skinned women. You'll find that there are more um, brown-skinned women married to white men than there are brown-skinned women married to black men, or, or if you like, black women married to brown men. But you find the opposite between black and white. But the brown-skinned community, in particular the Muslims, are very good, very crafty at creating a racial divide between white-skinned people, black-skinned people. And yet when you look at it historically, and this is one of the um, gripes that I have, when you look at music, particularly disco as an example, 
that was created by black and brown people. No brown skinned people in sight there. When you look at hip hop, black and white people, no brown skinned pe people. When you look at sport, it's predominantly black and white people, no brown skinned people are involved in any of this. So, so really, this this hatred or this divide or this political uh, paralysis between black and white people, I don't understand why is it then that people can't see that one of the major catalysts of uh, the contributions to the racial tension that we have in this country or even in Europe has actually been predicated on the actions of brown-skinned people in all of this, particularly the Muslim community. They're very good at turning around and saying, well, um, what about, um, say, the slave trade? Uh, this was done by uh, the the, um, the Christians and white-skinned people. But they're very crafty at not mentioning the 1,400 years of slave trade of brown-skinned people that they did with black-skinned people. Yeah. yeah it's a, these are very, I mean, obviously a bit of a sensitive topic. But it's a sensitive topic, it's a real topic, because this is what goes on, and this is what I was brought up with. This is what I saw. I saw it with my own eyes, this kind of, um, this tolerance and intolerance and this total contradiction of how the community behaves within, it, within itself towards other people outside of its own uh, um, demograph. Yeah. It's just interesting, though, that, that homosexuality, while not legal and, you know, forbidden within Islamic society... I mean, Pakistan leads Google searches for gay porn, right, amongst other things. And all sorts of crazy sexual depravity is very, very popular in Google searches in that part of the world. And um, there's a history of, a few people know it, but homosexuality in Islam, going back to the Turks and the Ottomans in the late 1700s, 1800s, that was, became a tradition. It was considered fairly normal. You know, like when people talk about the Greeks being gay, and all of that, most of which is uh, myth, but but that was a real thing in, in under the Ottoman Muslims. So well, the thing is, is that something you see my... in that's actually happening secretly, say in the UK Pakistani community. Well, well, there are always rumors. There are always rumors. But I mean, but um, my previous, I've had three YouTube. Well, I've got my third. I'm on my third YouTube channel. But the, the my second one actually has several different documentaries about the Bajabazi or the little boys that were kept for homosexual purposes in Afghanistan. Yeah. So to suggest that it doesn't happen, even, you know, uh, I'm sure if uh, there are other channels that have probably managed to copy it from me and then put it on their own channel, or, um, I've sourced it from, say, Rumble. But the butcher buys is a good example of boys kept for natural uh, for for those sexual purposes, very much like what the um, some of the Christen, Christendom, Christendom did with little boys that were called catamites. So that's just the, the Muslim version of a catamite. But also with reference to pornography of, say, homosexuality and animals, that's probably because homosexuality between men and animals is predominant there because the women are kept secluded. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, I mean, this <laughs> is actually not that unusual in Islam. So, you know, you've got this going on. But there's more. To, there's a lot more to this. Like, for instance, I mean... You know, it's just kind of weird that that this culture and this these are these are paintings preserved in the Turkish museums, like the Top Kapi Palace. You know, I mean, like this is nuts. Male youth penetrating adult male, nineteenth century Turkey, and this is in color. I mean, this is a very bad photocopy of the thing, but uh, but yeah, this is Islamic, and they retain this as, I mean, <laughs> wow. Did you just say nuts? <laughs> Because that, that 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 guy looks like he's up to his nuts and guts. Never mind. Moving on. So hold on. There's there's more, there's more of this stuff. It goes around. Um, I mean, there's loads of this stuff. Um, this I've got several of these pictures somewhere, but uh, I'm not going to hunt for them now. But but yeah, they exist. Yeah, these are terrible, terrible reproductions of the paintings. But yeah, just just wanted to show people that when because these days many Muslims will come on just as an aside. Many Muslims will like say on Twitter or whatever social media they'll they'll be throwing me oh and christianity you guys all have all the gays i just post those pictures I f i've got a bunch of those pictures like four or five that i just post and i say hold on this is this is uh the ottoman empire the pride and joy of islamic sort of uh you know um of islamic reign a couple of hundred years ago and this stuff is still preserved as art in islam and i just drop those and they it normally shuts them up very effectively 
Well, so there's a question there. Do you still maintain any connections or ties with your Muslim heritage or community? The answer is no, I don't. Very rarely on, on occasion, if somebody in the community has passed away and it was somebody that I actually got on with or respected, then I mm -hmm. might go and attend the, the funeral part of the um, ceremony. Um, I, Does your family but, know that you've left Islam and how have they dealt with it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I made no secret about it because um, when it, it's very much, you've got to bear in mind, when when born in the 60s and growing up in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, the, the, the whistleblowers were a very real thing in, say, politics and, 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 and commerce. So you learn that it, it, to stand and be counted for what you believe is something that's to be valued. So I made no secret about me... Um, leaving Islam and going along with the biblical narrative. Um, made no secret of that at all. Now, I'm, this is not an idol, but this is not a boast or anything like that, and I don't want it to be perceived as such. But, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. I can handle myself. I've been in prison a couple of times for violence. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that in a very boastful way because it's nothing to boast about. But I think what I'm trying to say is I wasn't some kind of timid little boy that was somehow going to be easily intimidated back into Islam. Um, I could handle myself at the time, and um, yeah, so it, it, that just made it easier for me to um, stand up against any sort of like a response I was going to get. Um, but also, um, someone has to make a stand. And the thing is, you see, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm some kind of exception. I think really the, the, the reality is um, that there are a lot of people that are brought up in the Sikh Hindu and Muslim community that don't actually follow the tenets of their their faith systems because the one thing i did learn when being growing up as a muslim is just how many of these people when they leave their faith systems actually go over towards uh, communism and atheism right and it's, and, and well, why do you think the they go to towards atheism and not christianity i mean aren't they being invited to church aren't they being evangelized why, why the move to atheism after, i mean was it just that they've been on so such an extreme end that they snap back to the other extreme I think that's a very good question. My only answer is to that is that when I came to understand the biblical narrative, there are, the Bible is very clear and candid that Satan runs the planet. Of that, there's no doubt. First John five nineteen, Re Revelation twelve seven to nine, um, Jesus's baptism when he says, says, "I'll give you all these kingdoms if you do an act of worship." The first chapter of the book of Job, if in, you know, so the the, the 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 scriptures are quite clear. So it's then then when you look back on say world history. Um, particularly with Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, as those, those were the religions I grew up with, you can see why they turn to atheism. It's because of how absurd their faith systems are. Their faith systems are so absurd. But then one of the arguments that many people have as to why they become atheists is because they can't reconcile the evil they see in the world, the injustice, because if there is God, then surely God will do something about it. Now, the biblical narrative gives the perfect answer for that. But their mm. faith systems don't. So what it does is as they're growing up in their faith systems, they see the stupidity or the barbarity of their own faith systems, but they're very emotionally connected to the um, the injustice in the world. And what they don't recognize is that they're made in God's image. No wonder that the injustice you know, resonates with them because because they're reflecting God's qualities, but they don't see it. So the easy answer in all of this is that there is no God or if there is a God, they become, you know, they become agnostic and atheism is sort of like a central idea to them that they can draw some kind of, um, if you like, solidarity with. Well, one of the things I love, for instance, when I go to, um, say, a Muslim funeral or the last two that I've been to, you know, it occurs to me that um, these people aren't really Muslim. They're just a brown skin. Gang. It's, Islam is just the name of a gang. It's a bit like the Bloods or the Crips. It's just what you're born into. They don't hold any of the tenets seriously themselves but what but as far as islam as an ideology is concerned on the world scene um the world missed a trick when salman rushdie wrote the satanic verses in as much that that when he wrote the, the satanic verses what people didn't realize was that islam is very fragmented um, and the the illustration I would use is very much like um, I don't know if you had it in Poland or if it happened I know it happened in Italy um, a lot as well as uh, say places in like the Netherlands but football violence of the 80s and the 90s um, Poland so was, in, uh, was probably number one in that back in the day really okay well I, I, I dare say so it, 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 though I never heard much about it probably because the news system that we have in the UK at the time was very much TV news and you didn't hear what much of what was going on abroad only in your home country okay so 
what would happen is you've got one football gang fighting another football gang when they played matches. So Chelsea would fight Millwall, Millwall would fight Leeds, Manchester United would fight Tottenham, so on and so forth. However, that's very much like the political infighting between Muslim communities or Muslim sort of like sects. However, come an England game, they all unite and they'll fight for one cause. And that's the same thing when Salman Rushdie wrote this, uh, this satanic verses. That was the first time on the world scene, people should have seen for themselves, they missed the trick, that the Muslim world united in, the, in their hatred for the criticism that they perceived in the satanic verses. To say that's that again, they, that, that this was actually it caused them to unite. Well, yeah, because um, the, what you find is that the Salman uh, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini put out, was it a $1 million fatwa on Salman Rushdie's head? I don't think the fatwa was the motive. I think the notoriety it united the Muslim world. And you see that now, ever since, say, um, the satanic verses, any time Muhammad is offended, you don't just find criticism in that country for what has been said. You find criticism throughout, say, you, for instance, let's say, for instance, the um, Charlie Hebdo. As an example, it took place um, in France, but there were protests in other country over, over what took about there. That shows you a united front against what took place in France about the criticisms that Charlie Hebdo or the cartoon comics that Charlie Hebdo were releasing about Mohammed. The same thing when um, there was a, a Miss World that was held in Nigeria. And one of the um, judges said that if Mohammed was alive, he'd have one of these women as a wife. Protests broke out in a couple of countries and 18 people died. You see a systematic pattern and all of this has been a byproduct or most more noticeably ever since the Satanic Verses was released. Okay. So people have really missed a trick there that um, they are not as isolated or as individual as what people think them to be. There is an underground structure in the Islamic world that unites them all and is triggered whenever an event deserves it to be. And, and, and what greater event than you've got now than the protests that are taking place with reference to what's happening in the Gaza Strip? Yeah, I just want to say yeah, thank you, Lil, for the purchase. And Mr. Rock for the donation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had someone write to me a couple of days ago um, from Texas, and uh, they've previously published a book, and um, they said that they watched my series on Palestine and the Soviet connections, and... Um, and also my, my series in atheism, and, and they are an atheist. And they said that they haven't found any evidence in their mind for God, and therefore they're an atheist. But he was shocked when watching my atheism series on how depraved atheism has been in the last 250 years and how these atheists, from their own words, believe in God and, and defy God. And they're not really what you'd call atheists. They are anti-biblical, anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-Christian. And, and I mean, they've committed the worst atrocities known to man, right, in, in recent history. And then he then also said that um, he was shocked that people aren't familiar with, with the truth of the history of Palestine and the Soviet connections, the Nazi connections, the, and also how stupid it is of, of leaders to want to create a two-state solution when the whole raison d'etre, the aim of the Palestinian side, is to murder all the Jews, preferably every single Jew on the planet, because that will bring Muhammad back. And then Jesus will fight at the right hand of Muhammad as Muhammad's companion, and he will pray behind Muhammad, and he will follow Muhammad, and he will murder all the Christians and break the cross and the, kill the pigs because, you know, blah, 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 because there'll be no more Christians and people to eat pigs anymore. And how can you live in peace with the people that literally want to genocide you and yeah, so so that's so yeah. I mean, the, just the just the weakness of people, but also when you look at Al Qaeda, when you look at some of their work, some of their writing, they had the thing called the um, um, ah, now the name suddenly escapes me. Let me see if I can find it. Um, ah, no, I don't. So I don't have it. But Al Qaeda wrote a book about atrocity. I, for some reason, the name just escaped my mind as I was about to say it. But they wrote a book on atrocity, and they mentioned that you have to commit atrocity, which will shock and paralyze people and allow you to take advantage. And you'll shock them into, into compliance and shock them into doing nothing. And part of, the, part of what they're doing is following this strategy so that you are so shocked that you are just stunned. You don't know what to do because they're breaking all the rules, and this leads to paralysis. And you have no... 
Nothing in your methods, in your systems, in your laws allow you to deal with this kind of thing. It's so severe that you're just lost for a response. The um, so I was just I just want to point um, respond to a question that's in the chat uh, by um, the horse. It says that, I'm surprised Gert Wilders has kept his head since the Charlie Hebdo days. I'm happy he has, but he, he has a large a large tag on him. I, I think that, that Gert Wilders has probably got um, a good set of bodyguards and um, probably rehearses his movements in a very um, deliberate manner to, so as to avoid any personal conflict but he he's got away with it so far but some in this country haven't done there was one guy that got stabbed for, for was it the guy that did fitna theo something or other theo von something he got stabbed and murdered there was somebody that printed a book or some a set of books or something they got murdered as well so much has happened since um the satanic verse as well and all it has done is embolden muslims to carry out um hits on critics of Islam, but then that should come as nothing new really because Muhammad killed his critics as well. Yeah, so all, so all the satanic verses did was create a starting point um, if like, or a catalyst for these things well, to take place. Few people realize that, I just found the book here, The Management of Savagery, the most critical stage through which the Ummah will pass. This is also similar to the Maoist doctrine. Mao had a doctrine as well, which he called uh, the People's War. And this was applied very successfully in South Africa. This was a doctrine of propaganda, which was, so you'd have a massively disturbing, violent event. You would, you would blow up children in a, in a playground. You'd kill 10 babies or something. And then you would have a propaganda campaign and, you know, saying that you did this because you were the victim and this is just your cry for help. And then you'd do something incredibly violent. And then the next thing you would do, you would then use this as a propaganda event. And so this is Maoist doctrine as well. So this is communist doctrine, socialist doctrine. Um, so this is the people's world worked very well in South Africa. They managed to stage a coup and take over the country, the communists. But also this is a Muslim thing. And of course, Al Qaeda taught that 9-11 would wake up the Muslim world. It would rally them because they respect strength. They respect violence. And this was the event that they created. And just like the whole Gaza thing, this is creating a unity. Few people realize they rally around violence. They rally around force. And there's no reasoning with people who have not been reasoned into their position, but have been indoctrinated or emotionally manipulated into those positions. And at some point, unless you take very hard stances, you're going to have to use violence or force to de-escalate the situation. It's, it's very hard to find a way to deal with people who want to use savagery, not just, you know, savagery. So this but is that, the, that should be. Yep. That, that should come as no surprise, though, Lloyd, because when you think about it, savagery is part of the human nature that we have to fight against. So you've got an ideology that caters for the flesh, the fallen flesh, and Islam is perfect for that. It caters for the fallen flesh in the sense of its sexual depravity, its attitude towards women, um, and its love of violence and the spilling of blood. Religion, the religion of Islam caters for the fallen flesh. That's what I mean by is if you prefer violence, if, you, if you're an angry person and such, Islam is the religion for you because it justifies, it gives you a religious foundation for all those sort of like um, fleshly tendencies that are manifest within you. But you just said a moment ago that it's a struggle to fight against this. Well, that's what Christianity is. The Bible teaches you to fight against the inclination of the flesh, um, to fight against the inclination of where, um, that's what Paul had the problem with. So, yeah, I mean, look, in that, Islam, for instance, you look, at, you look at the Sira, right? You've got in Muhammad's Islamic biography, um, in Sirat Rasulallah, right? If everyone can find that. The you can look for Sirat Rasulallah, but um, it's in my archive. You can find this. But Allah tells Muhammad, a prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. A slaughtered enemy is driven from the land. Muhammad, you crave the desires of this world, its goods, and the ransom captives would bring. So Muhammad is quite clearly worldly, clearly looking after the things of the flesh. But Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion. Islam must be manifested by death. I mean, this is very bluntly stated here. Uh, 
And this is what you see when you've got 1400 years of this ideology. Um, and, but you're seeing the manifestation of it now more so than ever because it's got nowhere to hide because the advent of um, uh, the internet. This is the other thing as well. I, when I was growing up, I had to go to the library to get the books to read what was contained within the, um, the religious text. You know, the, the so my polemics, if you if you like, started probably from about 1988. And I'm not going to suggest that I was going door to door spreading. You know, this is why Islam was bad. My arguments were very much as and when the, the arguments ever came place um, with the people I ever encountered. But then in the in the late 90s, you know, the the internet came out, and then YouTube came thereafter. And I never thought for a moment that um, that uh, polemics against Islam would become as big as they have and as popular as they've been. Um, but I'm not tech savvy either, so the question could be: So why didn't I get involved in the very sort of like late 90s, the early noughties, involved in any of this on any of this on the internet? And, and in a nutshell, I suppose I was quite naive. Um, as to how to use social media systems, but also I was kind of naive as to how big or popular or important that they would become, or you know, uh, underestimated the interest that people would have in in this kind of discussion. I've contributed to a few things, as you know, I've, we've done a few things yeah. together, Lloyd, in, in the past, but um, but yeah. it's, it's people like yourself now that are at the forefront of all of this. Um, and my my knowledge now. As actually, I, I don't know if it's true with any other people. Maybe um, Accra could, um, could confirm this in the comments that you learn more about Islam when you become an ex-Muslim. And I think that the same thing is said for many people when they leave the faith systems that they were in, that they were brought up in, they learn more from it when they've left it than what they did in the entirety when they were within it, with that, yeah. when they were inside it. Yeah. Well, Accra, and, thanks for your contribution. Uh, just briefly, someone asked, did, um, did Al-Qaeda choose September the 11th because on September 12th the um, the Holy Roman League the Hol Holy Roman Army shattered the Turks in Vienna and yes that is true because Al-Qaeda according to um, bin Laden he wanted to roll back the clock to before the time that the Ottomans were defeated in Europe before the Muslims were routed in Europe and then kicked out a few years later by Jan, King Jan Sobieski of Poland um, and um, yeah Perhaps we can slowly wind down on this one. Um, so, any how have you? How did you change as a person? How did you change as a person after you left Islam? How do you feel that your 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 perspective widened? How do you feel that your ability to express yourself opened? And are you disappointed with with the secularization of Britain? And do you see any signs of of hope? Um, I know that's three questions. As, 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 very, as, very much a, as far as hope is concerned, my hope is in Matthew 6.33 and Daniel 2.44. These to me are it's very real. The kingdom of God or the gov the, God's government is very real to me. It's not some kind of abstract concept or a condition within the heart. It's a real government that's going to manifest itself on earth in a very real way. Jesus told us to pray about it. Daniel 2.44 tells us how it's going to be accomplished. And it's not ambiguous as well in its writings as to how Daniel describes the implementation of the government. That for me is real. The next thing that you asked was about um, my worldview and how did it change me as a person. Uh, I, I would say that um, there's a line in the movie Train Spotting where um, the character turns around and says, here I am surrounded by my family and friends, but I've never been so alone in all my life. I would say that within a lot of human beings, there's there's the person that they are inside their heart, and then there's the outside projection that people see, their community sees, their work colleagues sees, and their friends see. Because there's a fear of revealing who you really are, because the, the world basically teaches you to be tough, and you know you have to have a strong personality, so I'm be strong, forceful, so on and so forth. But when you read the Bible. It's a, it, the way that it's written, the way that God is talking to you as a person, it really touches that person inside you. I think there's a scripture in the book of Samuel, chap, 1 Samuel chapter 16, I think it is, verse 9, where it says, men see with, with they see with the heart, whereas God sees, no, the men see with the eyes, but God sees what the heart is. Um I think it's 16, verse 9. I, I could be wrong on that. So what you, what, what, what I'm saying is that, it's very easy to become that person when you find that the God of the Bible is telling you that's the person I want you to become. Of course, we've all got sort of like um, traits that are um, 
I still have fleshly sort of like inclinations. If I'm annoyed, I can sort of clench my fist. And um, sometimes I'm, I can find myself in a situation where I think violence is the only way out of this, but I choose not to. But it's very hard for me to choose that. So it's just, just good luck for a lot of people. I don't have access to high explosives. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, yeah, it is. so there's, and also, and this is going to sound, um, I don't want this to sound um, inappropriate as well, but during the 80s and the 90s, um, I, 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 I was, you know, I went night, night club in the night club scene was my thing. So, you know, growing up in the 70s in this country, we only had three channels, BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. So the radio was on quite a lot. And if the radio is on a lot, you're being exposed to a lot of music. Hence, you know, music is the thing that I love about life. So when I got to the point where I you know, left home and I started nightclubbing, I, I found the thing that I really enjoyed in life, which was nightclubbing and, and, the, and the music and the dance scene. And I lived during probably the greatest period in music's history. So I was exposed to a lot of music, a lot of nightclubs and um, a lot of genres. But womanizing was one of those things I was exposed to as well. But I knew it was wrong. So I think what I'm trying to say is that there are many things that you do in life you do them, but you know they're wrong, but you don't know why they're wrong. It's only when you come to understand what the Bible teaches that you that it kind of like, it confirms, I wasn't wrong after all to think that those things were wrong. It is wrong to womanize. It is wrong to have sex outside of marriage. It is wrong to lie. It is wrong to steal. It is wrong to use violence as a, as a means to resolve a situation. And you only get that when you actually look at what the scriptures yeah. teach. And then, point, and I just then, want to mention something. So, sorry to interrupt you again, but this is the history of At-Tabri. Was he the cousin of Muhammad or something? History of At-Tabri. Yeah. And it says here, uh, oops, let's get that right. History of At-Tabri, volume 9, page 139. Layla bint al ibn Adi ibn Amr ibn Sawad, blah, blah, blah. Yet, good grief, what a long name. She approached the Prophet while his back was to the sun and clapped him on his shoulder. He asked who it was, and she replied, I am the daughter of one who competes with the wind. I am Layla bint al-Khattam. I have come to offer myself, so marry me. He replied, I accept. She went back to her people and said that the messenger of Allah had married her. They said, what a bad thing you have done. You are a self-respecting woman, but the prophet is a womanizer. What a bad thing you have done. You are a self-respecting woman, but the prophet is a womanizer. Seek an annulment from him. She went back to the prophet and asked him to revoke the marriage, and he complied. Just thought I would share that. Well, he's not doing anything that any other man doesn't do at the time, eh? I thought he's That's supposed to be the greatest of men, the best. How many women did Jesus sleep with? According to Martin Luther, three. So Muhammad slept with at least 22, I think, that we can count in the record over the years. And uh, Jesus, zero, as far as we know, although people do no, try to Jesus claim that he did. No, Jesus slept with zero. There's no exactly. doubt about it. Jesus didn't have any intercourse or interaction in an intimate way with any woman. That much is yeah. certain. Yeah. I just have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, why um, do you think that the church has let ex-Muslims down so that they switch to atheism instead of, I mean, they haven't presented a proper a proper alternative and therefore they, they leave and go become atheists. And do you see any hope? Do you, and, well, and, the and, churches have let people down. Well, you don't have to ask that question. The thing the church's example has spoken for itself. It allows gay marriages. Some churches teach Darwinian evolution. Some are tolerant of the LGBTQI drug maps. Some of them are heavily embroiled in the business ventures or capitalism with using the um, donations as investments like the Church of England have done. So the church has done themselves no uh, favours in any of this. Um, um, because... because, because you know, they've already come out from an ideology full of hypocrisy, okay, and brutality. They may as well stay where they are if they're seeing that the alternative is just as bad as the one that they're in. Right. Do you have a message right. of hope they, for them? Do you have a message for, for ex-Muslims, what to do, where to go, how to, how to view things? Something that would, would give them an alternative, the one that they're looking for, and find the peace that you found. 
Well, the, 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 you mentioned something a moment ago about atheism, where the guy turned around and says, "I did not know what this was, that, that this was atheism." I, in effect, he had he, he just opted for atheism without doing any of the um, the the apprenticeship of understanding what atheism really is. It's just like I, I, I don't believe in God anymore. I'm just going to become an atheist. It's become like a, a word, a phrase. You know, it's just something that you do with no understanding. And it's the same thing with Islam. People don't read the sources to, to understand what they're um, getting involved in or what they are involved in. For Muslims, I would say this, right? Muhammad, at the age of 52, married a six-year-old girl, and he um, has sexual intimacy when uh, she was nine and he was 54. Now, there's a principle brought out in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 4. We don't need to understand what Babylon is. Everybody has their own opinion as to what Babylon is. However, there is a principle where it turns around and says, get out from Babylon if you don't want to share in her sins. Now, what does that teach us? It teaches us one, one thing that many people don't seem to understand. It's what's known as communal or community responsibility. What that means is, is that from God's point of view, if there's an ideology that he abhors or that he hates and he's going to bring judgment on that ideology, you go down with it because you've identified yourself, identified yourself as a part of it. So, so my my advice is it become it comes incumbent on all people to to do exactly what the scriptures say. Um, Proverbs chapter two verses one to five talks about digging as for hidden treasure the knowledge of God. Jesus turns around and says, I think it's in Matthew ten, where it says, "Keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on asking." It, it, it's incumbent on people. And I think the Apostle Paul turns around and says, keep making sure that you're um, in the truth or be ready to make a defense for the hope that's within you. You can only make a defense of your faith if you've taken knowledge as to what your faith is predicated on. OK, so my, my advice to anybody is to get educated in the system that you believe in and ask yourself the question, do you, you want to stand with this ideology or not? You need to make sure it's um, true. For others, I've often said you need to work out whether there is a God first or not. You know, there, there are certain truths that are subjective. You know, is the BMW E36 M3 convertible the most beautiful car in the world? I would say it is, but that's a subjective. However, there are some truths that are absolute. One example is, is there a God? That's an absolute truth, if there is or isn't. And it's an absolute truth that there is a God. Is it an absolute truth that God made mankind and the earth and such things? That's an absolute truth that he did. They didn't yeah. happen by accident. So then, then you weirdly down to, well, if there is a God and he made all things, well, which one of these books is telling the truth? Well, in my, obviously, in my opinion, from my own research, it's the Bible. That's an absolute truth to me that the Bible is telling the truth about God. So the, there is a process that a person can go through if they're not sure where to start. I would say start where well, you need to work out if there is a God or not. Because if you're just going to go to the Bible and have an, an understanding of what the Bible teaches, then at what point is that not just an academic study? Your faith yeah. needs to be based on something. You need to be convinced there is a God first before you can make a defense for it. Right. Yeah, I just want to, India, there was something you said that made me think of something. Um by the guys, I have this on my community page, what you're seeing here, Luther's Works, Volume 28. It's his commentary on 1 Timothy, and it's actually page 246. It's not page 24, although I do say this in the text. It's on page 24, and someone wrote to me and said I couldn't find it, but they weren't looking at the commentary on 1 Timothy anyway. So, um, yeah, it's page 246, my error, but it, I do say so in the text, so they obviously never read the text. Uh, Martin Luther says, if I look at my sins, they are nothing when compared with those of Paul. According to the Spirit, however, Paul is nothing when compared with me. So this guy was very special. And there was something you said that, that, that triggered me this in me, and I, I'm not sure why. But, but Martin Luther was very, very special. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so look, there are bad examples of Christianity, but, but this doesn't mean that there isn't good Christianity. These violations of Christianity are not examples of Christianity, whereas uh, what we would consider good Muslims are are Muslims being bad, right? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we should maybe just wind down here, end up here. Um, so atheists, maybe then, according to what I heard you say at the end, should study atheism and actually see what 
not not what the highfalutin theories of atheism are, how amazingly mathematically precise it is, but look at the history, right? Like on my channel, and you can see atheism has been vicious. I mean, it has been genocidal, like nothing else in the last 250 years. And they'd see, and then also stop learning Christianity from people who don't have a clue, you know? So, um, yeah, th there's... They, they are, these are vastly different religions. These are vastly different ideas. And um, yeah, there's, Christianity built the Western world and we are ruining it by not sticking to those principles and the law that it brought. And, and, and the thing is, is with Islamic prejudice as well that you get from a very early age, you're already brainwashed into the, um, the mindset that the Bible's being corrupted anyway. So we all know that the Bible's not being corrupted. But in the eyes of the Muslim growing up, it can appear that the Bible has been corrupted because but they you taught them so the well is poisoned for them from an early age, from four or five years old. Exactly that. that. Yeah. So, so when they're looking in the media and they see certain Christian denominations behaving in a manner that contradicts what the Bible teaches, from their point of view, we can see the contradiction in their behavior. But from their point of view, they see that as a corruption of the Bible. That's the problem, you see. So yeah. what we see as a as, as a, a contradiction in what the teachings are, they see as a corruption. So from their point right. of view, it reinforces their worldview that the Bible has been corrupted because look at how these Christian denominations behave in a certain manner. Yeah. And just going back to the Muhammad, the Muhammad marrying a six-year-old, the goal in having sex with her when she was 19, going back to the principle of communal responsibility, in effect, what you are saying if, you're gonna, if you identify yourself as a Muslim is you're basically saying that there is nothing wrong with a 54-year-old man having sex with a nine-year-old girl. If you turn around and say that you're a Muslim, so there are 1.9 billion human beings on the planet, or 1.7, wherever the number is, keeps changing from week to week, who are basically saying just by identifying themselves as a Muslim, whether they realize it or not, whether they understand it or they not. They endorse it by their they, actions. They endorse it by their actions, yeah. by their statements. They endorse it. Yeah. Actions That's speak louder than words, and they tell fewer lies. When, when Jesus was held up by Pontius Pilate, to the crowds and the crowds turned around and said we have no king but caesar all right in effect what they were saying i think forget what the caesar's name was was it tiberius the caesar at the time i forget my history is really poor tonight yeah, don't worry about he it. was a, a homosexual pederast that lived on the island of capri with a 20,000 praetorian guard they were basically saying that pederast is our king not Jesus. That was the implication of what they were saying. Whether they knew he was a pederast or not is an irrelevance, but that's what the implication of what their statement was. And it's the same thing today with Muslims. When they say that our prophet is Muhammad, they're basically saying this child rapist is our prophet. Yeah, no. And they're not going to get away with that because we've now no. learned all about Islam. The internet has opened this door. We often know Islam better than Muslims do. But we need to take a serious stand because these guys are committed and I'm not sure how committed we are to ending this. But yeah, I'd also, so I'd like to wind down here, Th Thunderous, and maybe we can pick this up again next Sunday. We get to continue the conversation then. Yeah, 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 I will just continue. Uh, 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 can I just ask people um, in the chat, can you formulate some senses? I'm, I was trying to do this very ad hoc, ad hoc tonight, and I thought I'll... Um, when I went on Thaddeus' show and on um, Nuria's show, both of them had a list of questions, and um, tonight's show I thought I'll do very ad hoc, and I don't think I probably covered any of the points that I wanted to, or many of the points that I wanted to cover. So next week I'd like to discuss, if there's any further questions about Islam, please ask them. But I really want to touch on why I didn't accept atheism and Darwinian evolution next time. Okay. So if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. Okay, that'll be great. Yeah, so drop those and we'll we'll cover those next week. So we hope to have at least three of these conversations on this topic on uh, the on Thunderous's journey out of Islam towards Christianity and why he detests atheism. So, yeah, so guys, thank you very much for, for your time. Over 100 of you, that's fantastic. Hello, Dr. Obvious. Hello, Tom, Andrew Martin, good to see you. Catherine M., Don Scotus, and uh, so many more. Uh, good to have you all, Buddy Boy and others. So thanks very much for the contribution, for the questions, and to you, Thunderous, always good to have you uh, on the channel, you know, adding your, uh, your presence. And um, of course, <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it was really good meeting you in the UK recently. So guys, I was in the UK, I had to go on business. And uh, yeah, so I was I was incredibly busy. It was an insane time. So uh, but I'm back, although I will be traveling in a while to Barcelona. So I'll, I'll reach out to some of you. Um, 
and hopefully make a plan to meet up. So guys, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, horse. Very kind. Dr. Obvious, you're late. That's okay, but we can always rewatch. So guys, thanks. We'll, we'll see you all tomorrow night. I'll be doing, um, hopefully finishing the final episode on nominalism. And Tony, thank you all for your contribution too. So we'll see you guys soon. <laughs> okay, we'll see you with Anders in one week. Thanks all. Take care and good night. Mm -hmm. God bless. Bye-bye, everyone.